Hello and welcome everyone. You're in the right place for the joint policy announcement about building electrification with Safe Cities at Standout Earth. I'm Anne with Safe Cities at Standout Earth and very happy to welcome you all here today and excited for you to get to hear um, from all of these leaders who have been moving these policies and also a little bit about our new briefing note on building electrification. Um, so uh, to start off, um, uh, again, welcome, and I want to just uh, do a couple housekeeping things. We are recording this session, um, and I also want you to know that we will have a little bit of time for Q&A, and I want to ask that everyone put your questions in the Q&A tab um, on your dashboard rather than in the chat. It will make it easier for us to organize them. So again, please put your questions in the Q&A tab. If you are a reporter with a question, we want to prioritize you getting that answered uh, during this time. So please note um, your outlet and that you're a reporter in the Q&A tab with your question, and that'll make it easier for us to get to that. Again, we are recording the session. We ask everyone to put your questions in the Q&A tab. And if you are a reporter, we wanna prioritize getting your questions answered during this session. And so if you can note your outlet and that you're a reporter with your question, that will really help. I'm going to do just a really quick introduction to Safe Cities um, and then um, get into what um, uh, the specific excitement of our announcement today. So, um, Safe Cities at Standout Earth works with local government leaders and advocates to pass policies at the local level to stop fossil fuel expansion and phase out fossil fuels. And we have three policy areas that we focus on. One of them is electrification of buildings and transit, which we'll uh, focus on today. Another is resolutions that uh, explicitly name the need to stop fossil fuel expansion and phase out fossil fuels and talk about ways to do that. And the third is protections against larger infrastructure, everything from the size of prohibitions on new gas stations on up to much larger infrastructure. Uh, those are the three buckets we work on at Safe Cities at Standout Earth. Um, and today, obviously, we're focusing on electrification um, and specifically electrification of buildings. and. Uh, it's very exciting to say that we have uh, over 30 jurisdictions in the US and Canada that have introduced or passed a policy on building electrification just in the last six months. This is amazing momentum for the movement. And um, uh, we're going to be hearing from several of those leaders in just a couple of minutes. We also have a briefing note that we have created with several partners uh, and this addresses the false and misleading claims from the fossil fuel industry uh, that they use to try to stop the building electrification movement generally and in specific communities. And um, uh, we're excited uh, for you to take a look at that today too. Uh, but back to the main business at hand, which is what is going on with the, uh, this amazing building electrification movement. So the first policy was passed in Berkeley, California uh, in 2019. You're going to hear from one of the champions of that policy in just a moment. And again, in just the last six months, over 30 local and state governments have introduced or passed policies. This is great momentum. We're seeing policies in cold climate. We're seeing policies uh, very much centering the need to protect the most vulnerable members of their communities. We've got local governments inspiring states to take action and local governments developing policies despite state opposition. And uh, uh, with all that in mind, <laughs> I'm going to start introducing some of the leaders who have made um, uh, these policies possible in their communities. And we will start with Cheryl Davila. And Cheryl Davila is a former council member from Berkeley, California, was the champion of the very first policy on building electrification, which passed there, um, and is also the founder of the um, Climate Emergency Mobilization Task Force. And we're so happy to have you here uh, with us today, Cheryl, take it away. Thank you, Anne, and um, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Neos and Safe Seas Stand on Earth. I'm honored and humbled to be in this community this morning. Yes, I'm the founder of the Climate Emergency Mobilization Task Force and a former Berkeley uh, City Council member. And while on the council, we championed championed several leading legislations. In 18, it was the Climate Emergency Declaration and the Fossil Fuel Free um, Resolution. And now over 2,300 
governments around the world have since declared. And the Climate Emergency Mobilization Task Force was the brainchild of the natural gas ban in new construction in 19, as Anne just said. And currently, I believe there's 61 cities in California that have followed Berkeley's lead, um, with many more to come. All electric buildings are beneficial to one's health, welfare, and resiliency. The natural gas ban in new construction needs to be needs to keep growing because we see the climate emergency that we are in and the local impacts of the methane gas all around us, including the new studies with researchers find benzene and other dangers in gas pipes in California. A new study estimated that each year, California gas appliances and infrastructure leak the same amount of benzene that um, is emitted by nearly 60,000 cars. So thankfully we have safe cities that brings us all together, local elected leaders who are ready to take action, connects them with the peers and supports their work with technical advice, engaging in public in their communities and highlighting important moments in like this joint announcement today. So get out there and vote for folks that are gonna champion these electrical, electric um, banning natural gas and making sure all new buildings are fully electric. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you for being here. Our next speaker is Madame Marie Andre Mager, who is the elected official in charge of the ecological transition and the environment for the city of Montreal, Quebec also the mayor of the borough of Verdun. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for uh, to uh, Safe Cities for uh, highlighting the policies about new building electrification. Montreal is known for its uh, European character. It's the only French speaking uh, metropolis in North America, as you will notice uh, by my accent. The city has uh, 2 million inhabitants. It's uh, about 5% of the population of Canada. And Montreal is known for its uh, hot summer and very cold weather. And also we have experienced during the past uh, years important climate hazards, more important uh, spring floods, uh, more heavy rains with flash floods, more heat waves, drought, storms, hurricane, and increased average temperature. So, um, in the, for all this reason, we have taken a leadership in climate action. Montreal has also uh, adopted the uh, climate emergency in uh, 2018. And in 2020, the city of Montreal adopted its climate plan. And in this plan, we aim to reduce uh, by 55% our local GHG emission by 2030 and reduce uh, by 100% our emission by 2020, 2050, sorry, so to become carbon neutral. And our plan also include adaptation and resilience to climate change. So in the province of Quebec, we're lucky to produce hydroelectricity, so carbon neutral electricity, but yet we face a challenge of capacity. So our residential, commercial, and institutional building stock are heated and air conditioned, not only with hydroelectricity, but also with fossil fuel, uh, natural gas, and fuel oil also. And as a Nordic city, during winter, we need to heat our buildings to face temperature, temperatures that can drop to minus uh, 30 degrees, so it's about minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. So this requires a lot of energy and many, many buildings rely on fossil fuel to meet the ends. And all our residential, commercial and institutional building stock generate about 30% of our direct GHG emission. And last May of this year, we held our first climate summit and we mobilized uh, dozens of uh, Montreal stakeholders through a unique collaboration which we call the Montreal Climate Partnership. 
where we gather um, nonprofit organizations, the private sector, public sector, and philanthropists, and we work together to fight against climate change. And at this climate summit, Montreal made an important announcement. We announced our roadmap to achieve a complete net zero emission footprint uh, of all the buildings on, uh, on, in Montreal, but not only the municipal buildings, by 2040. So to achieve this uh, very ambitious goal, uh, starting in 2014, the small buildings and in 2025, the larger building will not be allowed to use fossil fuels in their construction. And we will also implement new energy perform performance thresholds to convert existing buildings to full renewable energy by 2040 with a significant reduction by 2030. And this, uh, this coming uh, December, we will hold a large public consultation about this roadmap to finalize the regulations details and to mobilize all the industry players about this major transformation. So our zero emission strategy for buildings is a key to achieving our uh, broader target to carbon ne neutrality. We need to innovate. Uh, no matter how low the temperature drops during winter time and how high the temperature gets during summertime. Uh, for instance, we will need to innovate in using heat storage, energy storage for our winter peak load and also our peak demand. Um, so thank you for, uh, to Safe Cities to amplify the movement for building electrification and to share information and collaboration uh, to accelerate our global uh, answer to the climate crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your work and for being here today. And this seems like a, a very opportune moment for me to remind everyone that heat pumps help with both heating and cooling of buildings, which is becoming increasingly, both of those things are uh, so important and heat waves have been su become such a huge issue um, for us across North America. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker now, who is Washington State Representative Davina Dewar, and take it away. Thank you, Anne, and everyone for being here. Thank you to Safe Cities for your advocacy. As a former city council member, I've seen how local leadership can inspire state policy and building electrification is a great example of this dynamic. Just in the last two years, um, Seattle, Bellingham and Shoreline have all passed municipal level energy codes that require new buildings to use clean, efficient heat pumps, electric heat pumps for most commercial space and water heat and half a dozen other local governments have study groups or docketed plans to develop local policy. This spring, our state, Washington State Building Code Council followed that example and adopted a similar statewide energy code for commercial buildings that will go into effect next year. Washington's policy will be the most climate-friendly commercial energy code in the nation. Potentially going a step further, the Code Council is currently contemplating passing a similar energy code for residential buildings. The vote on that policy will happen in November. Representatives from more than 39 cities and counties have spoken or sent comments supporting these updates. As an architect, I know how buildings must be part of the solution and efforts to address existing buildings um, is important because they're a significant source of greenhouse gases. Uh, Washington has just experienced a drought and uncharacteristic summer temperatures into October that we didn't even get to enjoy because the wildfire smoke made our air so um, terrible. Um, so climate change is upon us. Um, fossil fuel infrastructure has an outsized impact health and safety impact on our most vulnerable community members, both because of where that infrastructure is often located and the fact that they have less choice when living in older housing stock. So working together at different levels of government, we can advance a comprehensive approach that makes our buildings cleaner, healthier, safer, and less expensive to operate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Representative Dewar. Thank you for your work. Thank you for joining us today. And um, 
I want to note we've got a question from Tony in the Q&A about countering the messaging of the fossil fuel industry on this, and I will di uh, direct you first step to our briefing note, and the link to that is in the chat. Uh, we wanted to do exactly that, um, along with partners in this briefing note, and uh, we hope that helps. Take a look, Tony, and let us know what you think. Um, our next speaker is Mayor Nikki Armacost from Hastings-on-Hudson, New York. Thank you so much, uh, Anne, and to the SAFE and NEOS team for including Hastings today uh, during this very exciting announcement. Um, Hastings is directly south of you, Madame uh, Marie-André. We're just above New York City along the banks of the Hudson River. We're much smaller than you. We're only two miles square. We have about 8,500 people but we like to think that we punch hard uh, on terms of climate and we, uh, we are uh, pushing the needle on the things that matter here, um, here in New York State and on the East Coast and, and around the country. Um, we also uh, um, made a, a climate emergency declaration in 2002, which outlined some of the actions that we'd already taken and some of the actions that we intended to take and we were the second municipality in the state to adopt the New York stretch code. And now we're excited to announce that we are working to adopt the stretch to zero code where all new construction in the municipality would have zero on-site greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we're very excited about this. We're excited to work with our own community, with other experts uh, around the state and the country to develop a robust building electrification program that is a good fit for us, for the state and for the planet. And we are really thrilled to have this policy area opening up for us and for more communities in the, in the state. So thank you again, Anne uh, and team for including us. Thank you so much, Nikki. Uh, oh, thank you so much, Nikki. Um, it's great to have you here and thank you for your work. And our next speaker is board member Maureen Cunningham from the town of Bethlehem, New York. Thanks so much, Anne. And I will say, I'll turn on my video. I will say that if you're passing uh, between Montreal and Hastings, you'll first cross through my town, which is the town of Bethlehem outside of Albany, New York, our state capital. It's a town of 35,000. We also are making our own impact at the local level. Uh, here in Bethlehem, we know that heating, ventilation, and air conditioning account for 56% of residential energy end use and 32% of greenhouse gas emissions. I'm proud to say that we uh, passed in June of this year, a new comprehensive plan that's taking us to um, 2035 and really forward looking. Um, in that plan, we're encouraging the use of heat pumps. We're encouraging the use, uh, the electrification in our buildings. Other elements of our plan were a ban on new gas station development. We're one of the first in the country to do that. Advancing solar energy, transitioning our fleet to electric vehicles, updating our building code to New York State stretch code and improving at energy efficiency in our buildings. I noted um, actually today, one of the headlines in the New York Times were that countries across the world are failing to live up their, to their commitments to fight climate change. In fact, only 26 of 193 countries that agreed to take steps to limit uh, climate change have not followed through on those steps. So I'm really proud to stand with these other mayors today on this fight uh, against climate change. Uh, I, I think the, the failures at the international level point to a really great need for, for those of us who are elected officials at the local level to take action. And I'm proud, proud to stand here with safe cities and all of these great mayors. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you for being here. Our next speaker, we're, we will go back up to Canada. We will hear from Council Member Christine Boyle from Vancouver, British Columbia. Thanks so much for having me as well. And I am also honored to be in such great uh, company with all of you. Um, 
the city of Vancouver, British Columbia also passed a climate emergency declaration in 2018. Um, in Vancouver, about 56% of our carbon pollution comes from burning gas in buildings. And so our climate emergency plan has really zeroed in on um, buildings and transportation. 56% of our emissions come from burning gas in buildings and 40% comes from burning gas and transportation. And so we know if we are to meet our climate targets and, and like other places, we, um, we have been ambitious in our targets, we have not been meeting them. Um, and so uh, if we're serious about them, these are the places that we need to be uh, taking much more ambitious action. And, that's the direction we've been moving. Um, I'm I'm losing all sense of time now, but a year uh, a year and a half ago, uh, Vancouver passed a um, an ambitious new policy to ensure that new buildings uh, included zero emission heating and hot water that we were getting off of gas for um, space heating and hot water um, as a um, as a pretty clear first step in getting new buildings off of gas entirely. And in fact, that's that's really been largely the outcome of this policy. There was some push from industry to have that uh, delayed. Um, and fortunately with uh, good strong community mobilization, we were able to uphold that rule. And so as of January of this year, new buildings in Vancouver um, have uh, zero emission heating and hot water. We're looking at pathways and timelines for getting existing buildings off uh, gas as well um, with the sort of um, nuance of wanting to make sure we're doing that in a way that doesn't displace existing renters and see uh, uh, rents go up and so looking at different approaches on that front. Um, Vancouver has been leading the way across BC on this work. We're fortunate in a lot of ways we have our own building code. And so we are able to move forward more quickly and other municipalities around BC often um, follow our lead and we engage in joint advocacy to the provincial level to change um, the building code there so that others can follow suit. Um, and while we're leading here, we also look to others. We look to Montreal, we look to New York, we look to many examples um, uh, of where we can go. And so again, grateful for uh, campaigns like this and for the leadership of others on the call for the examples that we're able to follow um, and then the example that we're able to provide elsewhere. In Vancouver, uh, a couple years ago, we had a, a big heat dome event and a hundred residents in Vancouver died. Nearly all of them were um, uh, died in their homes um, because of uh, lack of cooling, um, because of overheating. A, a majority of them were isolated seniors, low-income seniors. And so we saw very clearly not just the um, impacts of uh, the climate emergency hitting us already, but also the ways that those impacts are intersecting with inequality um, and the the huge overlapping need and benefit of electrification in terms of making our buildings more resilient, making our um, our homes and communities more resilient um, to these increased weather events, the health impacts, the resiliency impacts and more. Um, these are important policies for our residents and they need to, uh, to grow quickly. And so glad to um, be able to continue to support the important Safe Cities work. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all that you are doing. And I don't think that we have Councillor Nakagawa here, but I just wanted to check in case. Okay. Uh, she was not able to join. Okay, great. I wanted to make sure that I just wasn't missing. Okay, terrific. Um, our next speaker will be Lisa Cunningham from Zero Carbon, Massachusetts. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yes. okay, great. Yes. Um, thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you to Safe Cities for putting this together. Thank you for all your hard work. Um, uh, I am one of the co original co-petitioners um, from Brookline, Mass, which put together um, a uh, fossil fuel prohibition in um, new construction and major renovations um, in Brookline, Mass in the fall of 2019. 
We were the first in a cold weather climate. We were also the first to include um, major re renovations and we were the first outside of California. So um, this was very significant. Um, we, our goal was not just to have this um, legislation passed in Brookline. Our goal was to have this legislation passed statewide and actually throughout the region and throughout the country. So we started a statewide movement, building electrification movement. Um, we got, we now have, um, 13 other towns and cities, including the city of Boston, um, EJ communities like Salem, um, Somerville, Cambridge, um, so large communities and small um, throughout Massachusetts who have followed us. And we've influenced policy at the state level as well. We have a new climate bill, which has a pilot program um, for only room for 10 cities at this point, but we are pressuring for more. Um, and we are trying to get um, this uh, policy statewide. So this shows the power of local legislation and it shows the power of local action. Um, we know that um, this is a, a climate imperative that we cannot meet our climate goals without doing this. We also know that it's a fiscal imperative because it makes no sense to be installing systems that we know um, we are gonna be needing to rip out in very short order. So. Um, and we also know that these uh, systems are cost neutral and, um, and operationally that it's less expensive now to um, run all electric than it is to run conventional fossil fuels. So uh, the fiscal arguments are very strong. We also know that the health arguments that many people have pointed out are also extremely, um, extremely pressing. We're uh, causing increased rates of asthma, uh, cancer, disease, and death in our communities. And um, that needs to be um, more of a talking point um, going forward. Um, we, we also are trying to um, move past just um, new and major construction because quite frankly, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And we need to start um, retrofitting our buildings and, um, and getting at the major part of our building emissions. So we've introduced new legislation in Brookline this fall in our town meeting. And we're hoping again that other towns and cities will follow us that we can influence um, other uh, municipalities in Massachusetts and, um, and throughout the country in, um, in this uh, legislation. Um, and I would like to say in terms of countering the, um, the narrative of the oil and gas industry, I think that's another way that local action is really, really important because we, um, we're up against uh, a very powerful, um, powerful enemy and um, a very well moneyed enemy. And so when we get our message out into the local communities and we, we educate people, um, we are really doing a lot to move the needle in terms of the um, narrative that people are getting from um, moneyed interests. Um, and uh, let me just see if I've got any more notes here. I think that's it. I'm just very happy to be on the call, happy to stay around and answer any questions and happy to be in such a group of really accomplished leaders. Thank you for all your work, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I just wanted to note uh, that Zero Carbon Massachusetts is one of our partners on the briefing note um, that we're also putting out today, along with Sierra Club, Electrify Now, New York Communities for Change, and Elected Officials to Protect America. And we'll talk a little bit more about the briefing note um, after a few more remarks from uh, the leaders in the jurisdictions. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andy Schrader, who is the Executive Director of Environmental Affairs, Water Policy, and Sustainability for Los Angeles, California, Council Member Paul Koretz. Thank you. Thank you to Safe Cities for hosting this today and to all the elected officials who are participating. And most especially moving forward, these vital policy measures, cities have to lead, and Los Angeles has been forging ahead. When we started working toward LA's building decarbonization ordinance way back in 2015, we knew there had to be an essential environmental justice component to it in a city of 4 million people. We wanted to make sure that any such ordinance would make people's lives better across the board, including renters and workers, and would not adversely affect or put an onerous financial strain on anyone. In partnership with the environmental justice organizations in the LEAP LA coalition, we created our Climate Emergency Mobilization Office and Climate Emergency Commission with environmental justice as their core tenant. And we vetted the policies through these channels before bringing it forward. It took a bit longer, but the quality was important. So we're adding gray water requirements separately to both address the drought, which is significant, 
and to ensure pipe fitters continue to work. In November, the city council will be hearing the ordinance to end gas in new buildings immediately, the beginning of 2023, with existing buildings close behind. If LA can do it, anyone can do it. I do wanna address the main reason for decarbonizing buildings. We need methane completely out of our infrastructure system as soon as possible. That means no natural gas, no natural gas. Natural gas is a bridge fuel to nowhere. Natural gas is a bridge fuel to ever worsening climate destruction, and we need to break our addiction to it as soon as possible. Don't be fooled by the terms brown hydrogen or blue hydrogen. These are gas company PR speak for methane added, and we must turn off that spigot forever. It's important for us all to remember that 1.5 degrees of global warming is not a goal, it's a limit. Above that limit lies climate chaos. Just look at the Mississippi River, look at the Colorado River, look at Hurricane Ian. Climate breakdown is already here. Let's not make it worse. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for being here and for moving all of these policies forward. And um, we have people from two more jurisdictions, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, this uh, uh, with another project partner, and then we'll talk about the briefing note. Um, and I want to introduce Ariana Sherzai, who is from, oh, sorry, who is the Sustainability Programs Assistant in Martinez, California. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Safe Cities, for inviting me and recognizing Martinez. It's an honor to be here and I'm thrilled to see that Martinez is among so many other cities helping to make building electrification a reality. And for those who aren't familiar, Martinez is a relatively small city in the Bay Area, about 45 minutes outside of San Francisco. Earlier this month, our city council voted unanimously to adopt an all electric building ordinance prohibiting natural gas and propane plumbing and appliances and all new construction. Being in California, we were able to take advantage of all the momentum happening around electrification policy right now. And so we looked at what other cities were doing. And we were also extremely lucky to have so much support from our mayor, our city council, and our community. The process really began when we passed a resolution last April declaring a climate emergency. And this resolution outlined several tangible strategies to quickly reduce our environmental impact. One solution was to adopt a REACH code, as it's called in California, that goes above and beyond statewide building codes. And then once our county, Contra Costa, adopted an electric building ordinance at the start of this year, we quickly followed suit to make it happen in Martinez. It's very exciting because we are already seeing the effects. Uh, some of the largest multifamily construction projects ever in our city are happening right now. And because of this ordinance, they're going to be completely electric. This means dozens, if not hundreds of Martinez families will have safer, healthier, and more sustainable homes. We're very excited to continue working on this and seeing the effects, and hopefully we can be an inspiration to other cities to take this step. Thank you. Thank you, Ariana. It's great to hear um, about how it's um, coming to fruition so fast. That's very exciting. And thank you for joining. And um, we're going to hear from Aya Cockrum, from uh, who's the coordinator for Fossil Free Eugene in Eugene, Oregon. And um, as we bring up Aya's video, I'm just gonna note that we have networks for both local government leaders, including staff, electeds, and volunteers on advisory boards, as well as a network for organizers. And we'll be sharing information about how to connect with those if you're not already connected in just a few minutes. Hi everyone, thank you to Safe Cities for organizing this and highlighting Eugene. I just wanna echo what many others have said. It is so humbling and inspiring to be a part of this panel and hear what everyone is doing. Oregon is sandwiched between two states as we've heard that are already making significant headway curbing the spread of fossil fuel infrastructure. And it is time that we planted the electrification flag in our state. Passing community-wide building electrification, first in residential as we hope to do this winter, and then in commercial and industrial buildings, would represent a hard-won fight by our community for common sense climate policy. But a victory in Eugene would have wider ranging impacts. The motions forwarding electrification passed by our city council this July has bolstered other movements in the state. We hope that success in Eugene will serve as a catalyst for other municipalities and for statewide policy in Oregon. 
In my capacity as a coalition coordinator for Fossil Free Eugene, I get to speak to and hear testimony from so many yearning for concrete action to transition towards a just and livable clean energy future. The passion and drive I've witnessed in our local movement has been astounding. Uh, despite the momentum Eugene has built, we are consistently having to push back on delay tactics from our gas utilities and the efforts to, and efforts to greenwash their product including most recently a costly hydrogen blending pilot project that is being proposed in one of Eugene's most diverse, industrial, and historically underserved neighborhoods. It is not if, but when Oregon will electrify, and the Fossil Free Eugene Coalition is here to ensure that we are creating a model building electrification policy that is strong and that has environmental justice at its core. Thank you. Thank you, Aya. And, um... I have uh, one question to share with everyone, but before we do that, um, I wanted to see if we could do a quick um, group uh, photo, Zoom photo. Um, I know some people will have to jump off in a minute and just, I know we've actually probably already lost a couple, but just to grab as many as we can. And um, so if anybody um, who has spoken is off video um, and can jump in, that would be great. Okay. Um, uh, Nathan, are you um, are you able to do the the Zoom photo? Okay. Will you tell us? Will you give us a, a one, two, three? Sure thing. All right. Three, two, one. Okay. And Nathan, can I ask one thing? When you did that, did everyone's nameplates show? I know I have to move my cursor right before I do it to get the they name. They did not. Let me try again. Okay. All right. Uh, three, two. Oh, they're going away. They go away so quickly. All right. I know. Uh, let me try it one more time. Um, I'm just going to take it real quick right now. So just, just smile right now. Okay. I'm not going to count <laughs> down. Okay. I think I got it. Um, thank you, Nathan. Thanks everyone for your patience with that. Um, okay, we have a question that I wanna put to uh, this whole crew um, and, but I wanna invite just a couple people to answer it because uh, uh, we would need a whole um, other uh, event to let everybody speak to this. Um, but I want to ask uh, the question that's in the chat about, well, is it more expensive to build all electric? And I'd like to um, break that up as you answer into new construction versus old construction. It's a really important distinction of what's necessary to electrify new buildings versus existing and uh, invite a couple people to weigh in. Um, and then after we address this question and maybe another one or two, we will hear um, from some partners on this joint announcement um, and the briefing note. Who would like to weigh in on the costs? Anyone feeling like they want to jump in on that? I'd be happy to start if anybody, unless anybody else would prefer to. Go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> well, on new construction and major renovations, which includes gut renovations, it's definitely um, more cost effective to go um, with all electric technology. Um, which is a couple of years ago in about eight cities, I think, where they showed that um, that at that point it was cost neutral, but since then um, prices, as everybody knows, have flipped and um, it's made it even more attractive in um, most parts of the United States to go with all electric technology. Um, this is combined with um, uh, building a better envelope um, in terms of air sealing and um, insulation. So um, it's important that we uh, consider our building envelope um, as we're building these new buildings and doing um, significant um, construction. I'm also an architect, by the way, um, just for didn't didn't say that before. Um, so this gets us to also the importance of doing new and major construction the right way, because um, retrofitting bu buildings is um, a very onerous proposition because you're trying to take um, existing, you know, perhaps existing ductwork or ductwork that doesn't exist, um, putting in new ductwork, you're trying to reconfigure um, old technologies for new electric technologies. So in many cases, um, 
that uh, that does need um, the all the incentives and rebates that we can bring to bear. Um, so the IRA is going to be of considerable help in this, and also um, there are also a lot of, in, for example, in Massachusetts, there are a lot of rebates um, that are available. One thing that does uh, is different is that when you are retrofitting with heat pumps, you're getting as many people pointed out, cooling and heating. So for a lot of these buildings that don't have cooling, which is now necessary in most parts of the um, world, not just um, Canada and the US, um, you're getting both systems. So in many cases, these things have not been updated with cooling. So that's sort of a value added proposition to um, any um, updating that you would need to do. But it just sort of highlights why these buildings have to be built the, right the first time and why we do need um, more incentives, more funding um, from our local and state and federal government in order to do these uh, building retrofits, which are really the bulk of our building emissions problem. Lisa, that's great. And let me um, uh, do a quick follow-up to you too. There's a question about heat pumps and cold climates, and I can't, can't think of someone. <laughs> Uh, there, uh, you're just a great person to answer this question. Heat pumps for cold climates mm -hmm. and also air conditioning. Well, again, um, so for air conditioning, it's a no brainer. And in cold climates, um, we're in Massachusetts, which is not the farthest north that you can go, but they've been used successfully as people pointed out in Norway. Um, they've been used successfully in Canada. They're used successfully in Vermont and Maine. So again, part of the, um, Part of what's important in this is to make sure that the buildings are constructed with um, uh, insul proper insulation um, and uh, that they are getting the right building envelope. And that can be done in a retrofit in, as well as um, with new construction. So in very cold climates, I'm not an expert in extremely cold climates, but I think that um, there are many parts of the country where uh, in Denver, for example, where this has been done extremely successfully with no problem at all in new construction and with uh, with with construction that is not um, upgraded in terms of proper insulation. Um, it, there there might be a requirement for some sort of a hybrid system, but um, in general, um, it's it's very. I also want to point out too that it's also operationally um, these buildings are less expensive to operate because of the efficiency of heat pumps and also because our pricing, um, gas is becoming a stranded asset, prices have changed, and that's only gonna continue to happen. And um, electricity prices are a lot less volatile. So the operational expenses are also extremely attractive for um, all electric buildings. Wonderful, Lisa, thank you. And I wanna note, uh, the briefing note talks about this, Norway has, a, has the huge concentration of uh, heat pumps per person. Uh, and so that's a very cold climate that is uh, very actively um, uh, using heat pumps all over the country. Um, is there anyone else who wanted to weigh in on the cost issue? I know Lisa did a <laughs> very thorough job. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Maureen. Great. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but I know um, being an environmental advocate in my day job, um, we often don't factor in the costs of inaction, but we see, you know, the cost of hurricanes and floods um, going on in places like Florida is literally costing billions of dollars. So I think at some point these uh, externalities need to be factored into the costs of inaction because um, when you look, at, you add that in, I think we're the cost of um, transitioning to electric is, is the way to go and is cost effective. Thank you. Excellent point. Excellent point. Um, all right. I am going to move to our uh, two last speakers for today. Um, and the first one of those is Amy Turner. And Amy Turner is a senior fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. And Amy has been partnering with us on this joint announcement, providing technical advice um, to uh, leaders who are working out how they're going to move these policies um, in their jurisdictions. And Amy, thank you so much for your work on this joint uh, announcement and for being here today. Great. Thanks, Anne. Um, well, I, I'd just like to echo uh, 
and add and add to the congratu congratulations and and thanks um, for the work um, of the leaders in this group to develop building electrification policies that work for their communities. Um, I also really want to commend uh, Anne, Logan, Nathan, Michelle, Alex, the entire uh, Safe Cities Network team for their work in, in bringing um, this group together and in shepherding these, these many different policies forward through the range of challenges that any policymaking effort can encounter. Um, this joint policy announcement and all of the work that's gone into getting to this point really underscore the value of collaboration among local governments. Local leaders face a variety of constraints on their policymaking, financial and legal constraints, geographic differences, energy system differences, political pressures, demographic factors, the list goes on and on. And that's why we see such a range of approaches to building electrification in today's announcements. And what cohort groups like this one and what networks like Safe Cities do is to help local leaders learn from one another as they contend with some of these questions and hurdles. They share encouragement, they share best practices, and they, they really cheer each other on. Um, and I, you know, I really think this shouldn't be overlooked. Because of this work, they make stronger policies. Um, the lessons that they learn inform more effective, equitable, and implementable, implementable policies for each of their local contexts. Um, I also want to thank this group for, for paying it forward, so to speak. Um, whether or not you all are aware of this, the policies that you're announcing today will help other local governments develop building electrification programs that work for them. They'll have so many policy models to choose from and you know, a host of, of at the ready mentors or have already spoken today. Um, and by doing the hard work to electrify your communities, you've made it possible for other communities to do the same. So really well done to all, a fantastic job. And I hope that you are already looking forward to the next joint effort. Uh, thank you, Amy. And with your help, we definitely will be. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I'm going to turn it over now to Dominic Frangillo. Tom Dominic is co-founder and executive director of Elected Officials to Protect America and former council member and deputy supervisor for Caroline, New York. Uh, he's a partner in our safe cities work with local government leaders and also on um, our briefing note. Take it away, Dominic. Thanks, Anne, and thanks to uh, the entire Safe Cities team and to all the elected officials and advocates on the call that have made these joint announcements possible. It's really incredible to see this uh, movement building, which Safe Cities is helping support of communities across the country that are without question turning the political tide on the fossil fuel fight for a livable future on our planet. We, we can't keep retreating from the fossil fuel industry. It's threatening our our communities, our democracy, our very habitable living planet that uh, that we need to survive. And elected officials to protect America is so proud to uh, be able to support uh, the work that you're doing, support safe cities. Uh, we are a network of current and former elected officials across the country that believe that elected officials are, are stewards on behalf of us all, that in the face of crises like the climate emergency, that it's our duty to lead courageously. And even when it seems impossible in the face of insurmountable, seemingly insurmountable odds like the climate emergency or fossil fuel political power, that it by joining together communities across the country, elected officials, public servants can turn the political tide. And you know we've we've done that together uh, with with all of you in New York, for example, um, organizing nearly a thousand elected officials to ban fracking statewide and divest the state from fossil fuels. In California, a major win just a few months ago with um, ending neighborhood drilling in communities, which many of you have been a part of as well. And we also are, are so grateful so many of you have joined in on our letter calling for a federal climate emergency plan over a thousand elected officials in partnership with the safe cities calling for that federal climate emergency declaration and plan so you are on the front lines you're the ones leading it you know and we will do this uh, building by building city by city state by state across the country until america uh, the United States um, and, and all of our countries, uh, we have multiple countries on the call, really lead the world in phasing out the fossil fuel industry, which is threatening our health, our, 
uh, survival as a planet. So thank you uh, for everyone and, and our democracy as well. So thank you so much to Anne and the whole team and congratulations to everyone on this joint announcement. Thank you so much, Dominic. Um, and uh, now we're gonna talk a little bit um, about the briefing note. Um, and I also wanna invite the team, I also wanna say thank you to the Safe Cities team. Um, and Amy um, mentioned several folks on the team and we have several on the call. Um, our, our whole team at Safe Cities and Stand Out Earth um, has been working uh, uh, along with all of these leaders towards this day. And so many thanks to everybody who has made um, all of this work possible. And uh, I also want to, um, uh, uh, ask if someone can drop into the chat a couple more links for connecting with both our organizing network um, and then also our um, network for local government leaders, which includes, again, staff and elected officials and volunteers on advisory boards. We would love to, um, to connect with you. Um, and then also the note, uh, the briefing note itself, um, if we can drop that again in the chat. And, um, and then also, um, if you are, as I am, fired up by what you have heard today and you just are ready uh, to take a cue from all of these leaders and do more, 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 um, you can help share um, their message and the message of this movement um, with a retweet today. Um, and if we can put um, the link for that, if you are uh, someone who does things on Twitter, um, if you can uh, retweet this message today and help get um, this out in the world um, about this effort, about the briefing note, um, about this incredible progress, again, 30 plus policies introduced or passed in the US and Canada in just the last six months. This is really amazing. And um, uh, uh, people, um, and, and some people spoke about it today. When you hear this good news, um, it will help, um, or when you share this good news, it will help people who don't even know that this is possible, know that it is, or give um, people that extra nudge um, who just need that extra nudge to really start making this happen um, as an advocate or as a local government leader in their own community. So if you can share that, that would be amazing. Um, I want to make sure, I don't think we have any other, uh, it doesn't look like we have any open questions. And so we are about, and um, we're just a little bit over time, but not too bad. And um, I just want to thank everyone for all of your work, um, everybody who's spoken on the call, and also um, everybody in the audience who is doing this work also as an advocate, as a local government leader. Um, and if you're not already connected with us at Safe Cities and you're doing this work, um, we want to know about you and find out how we can support each other. Um, and thank you again, everybody, for being part of this movement and part of the event today. <laughs>